Someone has taken an original NES and shrunk it down to the size of a Game Boy. And before you scoff and say, oh, that's just another emulator handheld, I'm here to tell you that it's not. This project was created by Red Herring 32, and it uses the PPU and CPU from an original NES console, but he made those components smaller too by manually shaving them to a super tiny size, going from this to this, so that it can fit into this handheld form factor. This is the Tiny Tendo, and it's pretty incredible. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Tito and welcome to another episode of Retro Renew. Today, I am super excited to share with you a project that I've been following for over a year and that's been in development for over three years. This is the Tiny Tendo, a fully functioning Nintendo Entertainment System with the same overall footprint of a Nintendo Game Boy. What makes this project even remotely possible is the shrinking down of the actual brains of the NES, the PPU and CPU, or picture processing unit and the central processing unit. These two chips are what make an NES a NES. Now this project comes to us from a well-respected member of the modding community by the name of Red Herring 32. By day, he works on his farm doing metal and woodwork, and by night, he tinkers with electronics working on some pretty amazing projects. Red Herring 32 is a self-taught electrical engineer getting his start by learning how to solder mods to his original Xbox, and from there things spiraled out of control. With time, his projects became more ambitious, one of which you may be familiar with, the Open Tendo, which is an open source hardware reverse engineering and recreation of the original 1985 front-loading NES motherboard. And it was that project that laid the foundation for the Tiny Tendo. From day one, Tiny Tendo was always an intended extension of the Open Tendo project, and it leverages heavily from the project's findings. Through his work on Open Tendo, Red Herring 32 gained intimate knowledge of the NES hardware, enabling him to shrink down the NES motherboard to its essentials and make it into this small little handheld device that you see right here. Believe it or not, the small motherboard of the Tiny Tendo does everything the full-size original version is capable of. Red Herring 32 poured three years of development and thousands of hours into making the NES into a portable handheld. Now, you may have recently watched the Gaming Historian's coverage of the BDL Express, which was a similar concept to the Tiny Tendo in that it was a portable NES. In that video, it was touted that the BDL Express was able to get the NES motherboard shrunken down from a 6x9 footprint to a roughly 3x5-inch one. While this was an incredible feat in and of itself back in 1990, Red Herring 32 trounced this by making his fully featured Tiny Tendo motherboard a mere 2 by 2 and a half inches. Heck, the Tiny Tendo motherboard is smaller than the original Game Boy DMGs. Talk about small. Okay, we get it. This thing is tiny, but what enables this device to be this small has to do specifically with the PPU and the CPU. Now, looking at these chips, they're rather large. They need to be smaller to fit into the overall smaller package of the Game Boy shell. Red Herring 32 was able to modify these chips so that they're roughly one square centimeter, smaller than the tip of your finger. But we'll get into that a little bit more later on in the video. The Tiny Tendo is truly a project of passion and love for not only the NES, but handheld consoles as well. Red Herring 32 as a kid dreamed of being able to take the home console experience of the NES on the go, and with the Tiny Tendo, I think he accomplished that goal. All right, so in this video, I'm gonna go over all the parts of the Tiny Tendo that makes this project possible. Then I'll do a brief assembly to show you how it all comes together. I'll go over all of its features, review the pros and cons, discuss the future of the project, and of course provide you with my overall thoughts. So Red Herring 32 actually sent the Tiny Tendo to the channel in a really cool custom box that almost looks like a retail product. And funny enough, if you scan this barcode using the Amazon app, you get a little Easter egg, some boneless herring snacks. 
Anyway, opening up the box and removing its contents, you see that there are quite a few parts. So let's go over each of them individually. I first want to talk about the motherboard. It's easily the most interesting part of the Tiny Tendo and really what makes this project possible. Now, like before, if we take a look at an unmodified PPU and CPU, you'll notice that they are huge chips. So Red Herring spent about five months trying to figure out how to make these smaller. A friend of his jokingly suggested to just Dremel them, and Red Herring actually ended up taking that approach to heart. After many failed attempts, he finally had a breakthrough and was able to get the two chips down to a much smaller footprint. And the key to everything was the discovery that the bottom of the two chips could be sanded down, exposing all the leads, as well as the die itself, and still be fully functional. This allowed him to surface mount these chips to the motherboard and keep the overall size of the board much smaller. Speaking of the Tiny Tendo motherboard, it's essentially a fully functioning NES motherboard. It pretty much has a complete feature set of mono audio mixing, as well as controller and cartridge inputs. All the parts on the board are brand new and readily available components, of course with the exception of the PPU and CPU. And like I mentioned previously, it's smaller than a DMG motherboard, which is simply incredible. Now the next part I want to discuss is the power management board. It handles charging of the two 18650 lithium ion batteries via USB-C and allows for charging while playing. It handles all the voltage regulation for the entire handheld and holds both the power and reset buttons. This here is the LCD driver board. It's a commercial off-the-shelf part that requires some modification. The first mod adds brightness control with this little board that was actually developed for Red Herring 32 by Uveltal Griffin. It uses an Atney chip with custom code written by Uveltal as well. Another thing that needs to be done to the LCD driver board is that it must be modded to run off of 5 volts instead of the 7 to 12 volts it previously required. This is done simply by removing a diode and adding a wire. And lastly, we need to add this custom video amplifier to boost the composite signal from the Tiny Tendo so that it's usable by the LCD assembly. This is accomplished by this L-shaped custom board. This next part here is the button PCB. This contains the same exact circuitry as an original NES controller. To design this board, Red Herring leveraged his work from another one of his projects, the PicoPad, which is a hilariously small, fully functioning NES controller. Now, of course, no handheld is complete without audio. So Red Herring designed his own custom audio board, which uses a mono amplifier chip to boost the output audio of the Tiny Tendo. It also incorporates a switching headphone jack, which disables the speaker when headphones are plugged in. And the last item is the cartridge slot PCB. This uses a new off-the-shelf 80-pin connector. Because the NES only uses 72 pins, the additional 8 are used to triple up the power pins. This connector allows the pinout of newly designed cartridges to be identical to that of the originals. And speaking of the cartridges, since the Tiny Tendo is small, well, the cartridges need to be small also. This is where another familiar modder comes into the picture, Bucket Mouse. If you're an avid viewer of the channel, then that name probably sounds familiar. I recently covered the DMG Color, which was a very cool project created by Bucket Mouse. And before he embarked on the DMG Color project, he worked extensively on reverse engineering and improving retro game cartridges, such as the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and of course, the NES. So Red Herring 32 reached out to Bucket Mouse to see if he'd be interested in helping design Tiny Tendo NES cartridges. He rose to the occasion and certainly delivered. He designed several board types to showcase what is possible with Tiny Tendo. These carts are built to be the same size as the ones for Game Boy, and as you can see, significantly smaller than their NES counterparts. Honestly, the design of these Tiny Tendo carts are just so much fun, and these labels are just icing on the cake. Here you can see an unpopulated SMB2 PCB that Bucket Mouse designed for games like Super Mario Bros. 2. Quite the difference in size. Anyway, these smaller carts allow the Tiny Tendo to work, and just goes to show how much effort went into this project. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention the outer shell of the Tiny Tendo. It boasts nearly identical measurements to the DMG, and honestly, looks pretty great. Red Herring even printed them out in this red and off-white color that almost resembles the original Famicom. Anyway, those are the primary parts of the Tiny Tendo. Now let me give you a quick overview of how they all come together.
Okay, so the first thing I wanna mention is that this is really only a partial build video. All the boards I'm using were pre-assembled by Red Herring 32, including the motherboard, which already has the trimmed PPU and CPU installed. This will just give you an idea of how the Tiny Tendo is put together. So we're gonna start by populating the front shell by dropping in the LCD panel. This is followed by the LCD retaining bracket. Next, we're gonna connect the driver board to the LCD ribbon cable. The volume thumb wheel goes in next. These are secured with two screws, and I have to say that the fitment is a bit tight. The bracket seems to bend just a little bit to hold them in. Then on the other side, we're gonna do the same thing with the LCD brightness thumb wheel. Now we're gonna go ahead and drop in all the buttons and membranes, as well as the speaker. Then we're gonna drop in the audio board. We wanna install this before the button board, otherwise we may run into some fitment issues. Now we can install the button board. I really like how Red Herring made this whole build very modular. Everything goes in very nicely. Before proceeding, let's give all the buttons a quick test to make sure that they feel okay. Now we're gonna to start to assemble the rear shell. The first thing we're gonna install is the cartridge slot PCB. Then go ahead and insert the flex ribbon as shown, with the other end connecting to the motherboard. It may be helpful to put a crease in the ribbon if it's stiff like the one that I have. And after the ribbon is secured, fasten the motherboard to the shell using the four M2 screws. Next, we're gonna to wanna to place the reset button into its opening prior to installing the power management board behind it. And once it's in, we can slide in the power board as shown. Be sure to install it under the two LED light pipes. Give the power and reset button a quick test to ensure that they're able to actuate properly. Now this is optional, but I placed a piece of thick card between the two LED light pipes to reduce any light bleed between the two. Now comes the fun part. We're gonna wire the two halves together. I'm gonna start off by first connecting the positive and negative battery terminals to the power board. Then I'm gonna proceed by wiring up all the button controls. For reference, be sure to follow the wiring diagram on Red Herring 32's GitHub, as that will have the latest wiring diagram since some updates were made to some of these boards since the making of this video. Now connect the controller wires to the motherboard. Next up is the audio board. Red Herring supplied this spiraled wire for the audio and ground. The spiraled wire helps insulate the sound and reduce noise in the signal. We'll also be using the same type of wire for the audio connection. And since it is hard to distinguish which wire is which since they're both a copper color, I recommend using a multimeter to ensure that you're making the correct connections. And here you can see we use the same wire to connect the LCD driver board to the motherboard. Now we're gonna hook up the audio board to the volume wheel. Again, be sure to follow Red Herring's latest wiring diagram. I'll have it linked in the video description. And don't forget to connect the VCC pad on the button board to the VCC on the audio board. 
Next, we're going to need to connect the power management board to the motherboard. I'm using old leftover resistor legs for this to make it easier, but you can also use wire if you'd like. Now we need to send power to the LCD through this 3.3 volt connection on the motherboard. And then we need to hook up the custom LCD brightness controller board to the other thumb wheel. And this pad here connects to pin one on our composite amplifier board. Lastly, we'll need to connect the VCC and ground of the composite amp to their corresponding points on the motherboard. Awesome, with all the soldering done, let's drop in our 18650 lithium ion batteries and test everything out. Now you wanna absolutely make sure that the polarity is correct when installing these, otherwise you risk frying the system. Great, now insert a game and power the unit on. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. I can't believe this works. This is so cool. Okay, all that's left to do is to button up the Tiny Tendo. And we're done. I have to say that the Tiny Tendo is an amazing project. The sheer amount of work that went into its design, ranging from the outer shell, the PCBs that needed to be designed, as well as the work to shrink down the PPU and CPU. It was an enormous undertaking, and Red Herring 32 really pulled it off. The build itself actually went rather smoothly, but I do have to confess that all the boards I used were pre-assembled, and to actually build everything from scratch would have been far more difficult, especially the trimming of the PPU and the CPU. Now, you may have noticed that the rear shell color has changed. I actually had to print a new one since several of the screw posts for the cartridge PCB broke off after assembly. Red Herring had actually been redesigning the shell to reinforce the cartridge port area, and he sent me the updated version, and it works quite a bit better. Anyway, let's do a quick rundown of all the key features of the Tiny Tendo. The first and most obvious feature is its form factor. It looks and feels like a DMG. Overall, it's very comfortable to hold, and those with larger hands would probably appreciate the added thickness. It features both brightness and volume controls via the thumb wheels on either side of the system and works exactly as you'd expect. Around top, you'll notice the prominent USB-C port, which is used to charge the two internal 18650 lithium ion batteries. The unit allows charging while playing, which is a very convenient feature. And right next to the USB-C port are two indicator LEDs. The green one indicates that the unit is power on, while the other tells you the charge status when plugged in. On the bottom of the unit is the headphone jack that automatically switches off the speaker when headphones are plugged in. And right above that is the speaker, which gets plenty loud. Front and center is the large three inch display, which looks fantastic, although I do wish it was a bit brighter. So when it comes to features, it has everything you'd expect from a handheld. It's nothing crazy, except for the fact that we can now play NES games on the go on authentic Nintendo hardware, which is simply amazing. Okay, so now that you got a tour of the device, let's go over the pros and cons. Starting with the pros, I have to say that this is an absolutely incredible project. The amount of engineering and new concepts that had to be developed in order to make this project happen is no small feat. Not only that, Red Herring 32 pulled this project off with such polished results. And the contributions to the project from the likes of Bucket Mouse and Uveltal showcase why the retro modding community is just so amazing. Teamwork makes the dream work. The games look fantastic, and the whole system works as one would expect. The culmination of years of work, which definitely shows the passion he has for the NES. All right, those are the pros, but now let's get into the cons. First, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This mod is difficult. On top of having to assemble from scratch each of the various boards required for the build, the single most difficult part has to be the trimming of the PPU and CPU. That task right there has no guarantee of success, and you really need to know what you're doing or you risk needlessly sacrificing NES chips. Red Herring has made a very detailed trimming guide on his GitHub for those that want to try this, but still, that part of the build remains the most daunting. The only other con in my opinion is the shell. During my build, I had several screw posts break on me. 
but that could have been down to the material used or the settings of the 3D printer. I discussed some of the shell issues with Red Herring, and he already updated the design to make the posts more robust and the cart PCB to be more secure, since that is obviously an area that exhibits a lot of external forces due to the repeated inserting and removal of game carts. Now, one of the things that Red Herring asked me to mention in this video is that he's not going to be selling these as kits or fully built systems, so please don't reach out to him asking him to build you one. The project is completely open source, and all the documentation, files, and instructions are available on his GitHub if you want to build one on your own. Regardless, I would definitely check him out on Twitter where he posts all the latest news on his work and projects, so definitely give him a follow. Anyway, the last thing I want to touch upon is the future of the Tiny Tendo project. Now, when I asked Red Herring about this, his response got me really excited. As you know, because the Tiny Tendo uses real NES hardware, it is theoretically compatible with all games, with the exception of light gun games. While they would run on the Tiny Tendo, you wouldn't have a way of playing them since you can't plug the light gun in, and even if you could, it won't work because those require a CRT monitor. So the way Red Herring is planning on implementing this functionality is by integrating a touchscreen. If he can pull that off, that would be amazing. Additionally, he's thinking of adding a turbo button feature, as well as making the Tiny Tendo even tinier so that it would fit into a Game Boy Color or even a Game Boy Pocket form factor. So the future of the Tiny Tendo looks bright, and I'm excited to see where Red Herring 32 takes it. So there you have it the Tiny Tendo project from Red Herring 32. An incredible undertaking with incredible results. Now, if you enjoyed this video, I really think you'll like this one here, so check it out. And as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again next Thursday.